When you look back through its history of games, Digimon is an interesting one. Throughout the years, it's gone a variety of games on a variety of systems. The comparison between it and Pokemon to me has always been close to that of Sonic and Mario. With the former being more experimental and varying from game to game, and with the latter focusing on building its own core experience regardless of innovations. And in a very similar way to Sonic, this led to a lot of inconsistency for the series throughout the years, and was a game series that was hard to recommend to non-fans. But in 2006, Digimon Story, or known to us as Digimon World DS, would release. Story would be a shift in the series providing it a solid formula with it taking strong elements from previous ones to form itself. If you asked me before the game in question today what would be the best Digimon game to get into, it would have been Digimon Story and its follow-ups Dawn and Dusk for sure, just fundamentally solid RPGs that are easy to pick up and play and have a good time with. But the following games like Digimon Story Lost Evolution would not come over, leaving us without the series for quite a number of years in the West despite finding a formula that seemed to work. And even then, with the story style, it would go on to try out different styles regardless in its classic Digimon fashion. I don't know why Digimon stopped coming over specifically, but it was likely due to a lack of sales and interest, a pretty common tale for a lot of series over the years. We live in a day and age where so many games get released and so quickly as well that it's weird to think of a time when that wasn't the case and even big games like Final Fantasy could take upwards of a year or more for localization. But a group of fans couldn't accept this fate for Digimon and started a movement Operation Decode to show Namco Bandai, the creators of the Digimon games, that there were fans who still cared in the West. Now, this was originally for the PSP and later 3DS title, Redigitized, but as it got traction it changed to Cyber Sleuth at the request of Bamco. This might seem like a dick move to change the game, but I get where they were coming from. Redigitized was in the same style of Next Order, the last game I covered. I think it's been like a hundred years since then, honestly. A unique game, and one I like, but not one that would revive the brand in the West. To succeed, they needed something safer, and Sleuth was that safe option because it was not only Digimon Cyber Sleuth, but Digimon Story Cyber Sleuth. And like its namesake entailed, focused on delivering a basic, fundamentally sound JRPG that anyone could get into rather than something that would break their kneecaps for not taking 10 hours to grind and min-max the game. The movement's petition got enough support, and Sleuth was localized. To clarify, Habukazu Masa, the game's producer, did confirm that this petition is indeed what opened up the way for the series' return. In this day and age, we can't forget that we the fans do have the power to come together and make positive change, and I like this story because it shows just that. If something isn't right, we can fight to change things for the better. But back to the actual game, today I'll be covering the PS4 version, but those who watch this, get the Switch or Steam version. It comes with improvements all around, and also with both Sleuth and its sequel side game Hackers. The original PS4 version is fine, but for some dumb reason it's been delisted so you need a physical copy. And as for the Vita, it's also delisted and runs pretty poorly anyway, so it's hard to recommend. Anyway though, let's finally get to the game that brought Digimon back. Welcome to Cyber Sleuth. Sleuth takes place in a fictional Japan, where Kamashiro Industries have created a digital world in the form of Eden. People can log into this world, explore it, hang out with friends, buy stuff, and so on. It's an interesting take on the digital world, as in most games you go to the world proper, and your time in the real world is limited, if at all. But here it's a combination of real world and cyberspace making it a fresh departure from other Digimon games. One that also lets them show how real people and places are affected by the influx of Digimon. Like a game dev whose project is being overrun, or Wikipedia articles being changed left and right by a mischievous Digimon. And because of accidents like these and hackers, people who tame and use Digimon, cyber crimes are on the rise. You work as a cyber sleuth who works to stop and investigate these cases. Everything from small problems to mysteries to large conspiracies. The major one being the Eater case. Alongside Digimon, these mysterious Eaters have shown up and have begun to devour everything in sight, including people. You, while escaping one, got caught halfway through logging off, turning you into a half-human, half-cyber form, giving you the ability to enter all forms of cyberspace. Using this power, you decide to investigate the Eaters, find a cure for those who could not escape, and the deeper conspiracies of the Kamashiro Corporation. It's pretty clear just from this basic summary that Sleuth values its story much more than last time's Next Order. To give you a better idea, it's like they took an all-new season of the Digimon anime and made it into a game instead of a show. 
It cares about its story, its characters, and its setting, and it wants to bring you along for all the goofy Digimon hijinks and drama. In fact, as an insider looking out who saw so many people get into this game, its dedicated story is one of the things that surprised people and drew them in. A lot of monster raising games can feel open-ended and not as story focused to give the game and raising aspects more freedom and flexibility. Which is totally fair, but Sleuth is closer to something like Nino Kuni, which is more of a JRPG which just happens to have monster raising in it. If you get what I mean. It's the type of game where you don't have to care about monsters to enjoy it, which is one of the primary reasons which I think Banco went with this over Redigitized. I could hand this to a whole load of people and they would be able to enjoy it. Unlike Redigitized, where I can only really recommend it to a specific type of person who would like that type of game. But I should also mention to not expect too much from the sleuth part. It's enjoyable to an extent, but it's very surface level. It's more of a fun hat it wears, but it's not a true detective-like game. A lot of mystery or intrigue is really told to you, or easy to figure out. It does have its moments from time to time, but don't expect Layton or Phoenix Wright or Ghost Trick out of this. And you know, I get it, it's a Digimon RPG first and foremost, but they could have done more of the motif, like having more involved mysteries you had to actually solve instead of just press X through them. And while I'm on this train, while Sleuth is at the end of the day an enjoyable story, it's also one that does begin to lose its focus in its second arc. Like, a lot of cool stuff happens, but it ultimately lacks direction on where it wanted to go in my opinion. They have fun ideas at play, but they don't really come together at the end. Now this is all pretty vague because I don't want to spoil too much since it is still a good story, but let me give you a concrete example. Arata Sonata is one of the main core cast in your hacker friend. While a loner by nature, he's a good guy at heart and a huge nerd and really likable character. At the second arc of the game, he's pinpointed as a scapegoat for a crime. And then here, he escapes and says he's breaking off all ties, but this is less out of edginess and more out of a wink to the rest of the cast in order to take the potential heat off them as well. Basically, it's a mutual understanding. But the next time he shows up, he's acting as if it wasn't understood and is some dark loner looking for power. It's not necessarily not in line where his character is, but it's like we missed a lot in how we got from A to B. And from where we last saw him, it doesn't make a lot of sense for him to become like this with what the game gave us. An issue with this game in general is that members of the core cast develop off-screen, and while the idea of several people going on their own adventures at the same time is neat, it also ends up weakening the arcs for some of the cast. Now the follow-up game Hackers actually includes a decent amount of extra characterization to fill in some of these gaps for the cast and even some of the story, but I still have to judge this game by its own merits, and yeah, it's still good. I love the fresh setting and effort put into the game's world and story, but you know, I still think some more commitment to the game's gimmick thematically, a stronger idea of what it wanted to do with its finale, and more characterization would have made the game all the more stronger writing-wise. But still, for what it is, it still did the job right enough and delivered a story and setting that a lot of people can enjoy. And if we're talking about things people can enjoy, I think one of the things to jump to is the Digimon themselves. The Digimon models look really crisp and nice in HD. The designs themselves get some flack here and there for some of the weirder designs, but on the whole, a lot of them range from unique to straight up sick. Like, are you gonna come to my face and tell me War Greymon and Galmon aren't clean as hell? You're actually lying. Each Digimon also has a few of their own unique animations, from generic attacks to their own moves to a unique wind condition, and it gives them an even deeper level of charm and personality for each one. I mean, they do copy some Digimon every once in a while, but on the whole, a lot of good stuff all around. As for the character designs themselves, they were done by Suzuhito Yasuda, artists behind stuff like Dorarara and Devil Survivor, and they look fantastic and really meld with Digimon's art style. I don't know what it is, but his sharp, distinct style just works with it, and I wouldn't mind if they kept him around for future Digimon Story games. Not purely visually, I do think the game isn't gonna win awards or visuals of a generation, but combined with all the stylistic choices I've talked about and many more like its cyberspace, it comes out being visually distinct and unique. Now I do think they reuse a lot of these cyberspace areas and character models, and could have been a bit more creative and varied with them but it still does a good job overall. It was also a Vita game too originally, which definitely held it back. Like, the Vita could do good things on occasion, but in this case it didn't do it any favors visually. It also runs pretty poorly on the system too. And I do gotta say though that because it is a Vita game ported to other systems, it runs smooth as butter on console and loads a lot faster, which makes the game feel really nice to play on the whole. You know what's also nice? The music. JRPGs and good music go hand in hand in general, and even if a JRPG is bad, it usually still pops off musically. 
Street. But Digimon games have this unique digital soundtrack that goes along with their settings. I've been playing tracks throughout the video from the series to give you a feel for its vibe. Along with this though, Sleuth also has a lot of good songs that play well into the detective aspect too, while maintaining its digital feel, which is pretty impressive. Overall, it's a great soundtrack, no complaints here at all. I should mention though, because I actually forgot to talk about the music last time, that Next Order has a good soundtrack too. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is I need to remind you all that I have no idea what I'm doing at any time. Now speaking of Next Order, one of the things that really set it apart was its hands-off gameplay. You raise your Digimon and while you had some control over it, it was a lot of going with the flow. Once again, unique, but not exactly the most intuitive style. Order was also pretty challenging on the whole, making it hard to get into unless you like the game's raising and gameplay systems. But Sleuth is good old turn-based gameplay, easy to pick up and learn, and is a lot fairer. Although if you want a challenge, it does have a hard mode. It all adds to the running theme of Sleuth being the beginner-friendly game Bamco needed for the series' return. But it also does go a bit deeper than that. In an absolute parallel to Next Order in which you raise two mons at a time, in Sleuth you can and are encouraged to raise an absolute ton. Three in the front line, a bunch in the back, and digi farms that can be filled with digital monsters. Not only that, these Digimon can all digivolve and devolve into a bunch of others giving you a ton of options and pathways to go with your party. What is better for a game to bring back the series than one that lets you raise so many different Digimon at once? If you're unfamiliar with the series at the start and don't have any favorites, you sure will by the end of it. And it's not that you're doing this just for the fun of it. Sleuth puts in a rock, paper, scissor type system to make sure you raise a good variety of mons. Vaccine beats virus, virus beats data, data beats vaccine. Simple and straightforward. There are also neutral types, but given how you can have such a large party, I kinda ignored them since you could just swap in a super effective one instead of just having a neutral one. Sleuth also has standard elements like fire, nature, and all that to further increase damage, but they also don't give any defensive benefit and are more of a, if you happen to line it up, great! If not, who cares? And to reiterate, every Digimon also has their own unique move and ability. It helps to make your party more distinct even when you bring three of the same type and helps them stand out from one another. And before you think this simplifies the game, well, in the beginning, if you take the time to prepare a palance party, yeah, you steamroll it. But as it goes on, type matching becomes less a reward and more something you need to do, lest you get steamrolled yourself. This is because bosses start hitting harder, have more gimmicks, or just move multiple times. You also have limited party space that expands as you find more memory chips throughout the game. So unless you avoid evolving your Digimon, you won't have a full-on party for most of the game. But I do like that balance. Do you want a party full of champions covering all bases, or a few ultimates who don't but are much stronger? I will say though that I don't like that some of these memory ups are in random chests and dungeons. A better option would have been tying memory space to your sleuth rank, which expands with the more cases you do, which would incentivize doing the side content. Because, you know, that would be better than missing out on a potential party member's face because you didn't go for that one chest on the other side of the route of the dungeon you didn't take. Memory is kind of mandatory though in this game, as without it, you could easily reach higher forms before the game expects you to and could actually steamroll it, so this system does provide a balancing act with your own team making decisions as I mentioned before. Overall though, Sleuth does provide challenging fights, requiring you to adapt your team so it never will it ever become too overwhelming on normal mode. Like, there is one annoying boss that heals itself and constantly changes type, but overall, most of the gimmicks of these bosses are manageable and only serve to spice things up. But Sloop is one of those games that if you know what you're doing, you can break it in half. First off, every dungeon has a digi lab where you can swap out your team and also heal up. Meaning if a boss stomps you and you raised a lot of Digimon, you can come back with a team of effective ones and make it a lot easier, further making raising a bunch of different Digimon rewarding. There's also a shop you get around the halfway point which sells incredible healing items that heal the front line for half their HP and SP. And then we finally reach the true thing that can make Sleuth an absolute cakewalk. Let's play a game, my Cyber Sleuths. Which is the broken one? Single target attack. AoE attack. Support move. Ignore defense and multiply damage dealt. Okay, Sleuths, which is the broken one? I, I don't know, this is too hard. But yeah, you get a Digimon with one of these piercing moves and you're set for any fight that doesn't resist it, and even then they'll still likely deal damage on par or more than super effective ones. Now for most of the game, I try to avoid these because without them, it still maintains a fair challenge. 
but at the end, not only does one of my absolute favorites have this as a signature move, but I also think in general the HP values for enemies at the end game are so high that I felt inclined to use it because the rest of my party was basically doing a crumb of their health. Slew for 99% of it has you basically have a near full party of Digimon with all of them feeling useful and impactful and I love that feeling. Whereas at the end it became the War Greymon show which hey, I did say this was like a Digimon anime right? So it really is just immersive, right? It's not a deal breaker at all, and I can't lie, one-shotting bosses feels really, really good, but at the same time, I do hope that when they return to the story series of games that they try and spread that power around. Make it more balanced, but don't just drop Pierce, but bring other Digimon up. Make it so my entire squad of Megas feel valuable, because for 99% of the game, my entire team felt like they pulled their weight, and that balancing act is not an easy thing to do, and it's something that I loved about most of this game. And you know, in general, because this game has so many options and so many fallbacks in terms of ways to make it easier, I think it's actually a great beginner RPG to get your feet wet if you aren't too experienced with this type of game. Even if you're having trouble, just by properly raising your Digimon and stocking up on items and maybe getting a Pierce Digimon or two, there's no problem in the main game you can't overcome. Which, once again, for a comeback game, that level of accessibility can't be understated, and it's not like it's totally brain dead easy either, it's just a game that can be exploited if you know what to do. A nice balance to have, and a nice way to break into the series. And really, that's all I can say for Cyber Sleuth. It was a nice re-entry point of Digimon back into the West that fans both new and old can enjoy. Both Sleuth games are currently available as a dual pack on Switch and Steam, which are the ones that I recommend the most and are more than worth the asking price. But they also go on sale pretty often, so if you're on a budget, it could be good to wait a couple of weeks to grab it half off. PS4 versions are still fine, they're what I played for both games, but like I said, it was stupidly delisted, so you have to track down a physical copy if you want to play it that way. Anyway, that was Cyber Sleuth. Thank you for watching, and next time I'll be back with Hacker's Memory. Probably. I don't know, don't hold me to that.